education program in, in the country. And I like Arkansas leading in that. We have over 6,000 students in Arkansas taking computer coding at the high school level. We are devoting $2.5 million each year to train teachers as to how to teach coding and computer science. We are making it mandatory in the high school, but it's also being incorporated in grades K through eight. So it's a totally integrated curriculum that we have in our school systems in terms of coding. And because of that, technology companies are moving to and growing in Arkansas because of our talent and also because of our accelerator program that we're putting $2 million every year into attracting talent in new technologies and uh, uh, innovative and disruptive solutions. In addition, because of our coding initiative, uh, next year we're going to provide our students an opportunity to see network attacks and defenses by having access to a cybersecurity range being developed at the University of Central Arkansas. It will be made available through Arkansas Educational Television. I'm proud of that initiative and I went to West Memphis and I saw the students in a very rudimentary way trying to learn cybersecurity. Next year they will be able to go online, log in time on a cybersecurity range to see simulated attacks and how defenses work. It's a real world exercise for our high school students and we'll be the only state in the country that utilizes a cybersecurity range for educational purposes. <laughs> but Arkansas has an opportunity to do more and go further in terms of technology through industry-led blockchain development in the food industry. And that's why we're here. And you might ask, and I think Marielle addressed this to a certain extent, why Arkansas? Well, our agriculture is our number one industry. Whenever you look at our state and the fact that we produce over half of the rice produced in the United States of America, that's not only a bragging point that I can make uh, as I travel globally, but it's a reality that emphasizes the importance of agriculture to this state. From timber to cotton to cattle and poultry, Arkansas produces for the world. And the second reason that uh, this is important today, talk about food security, is that the global marketplace is essential for our agriculture. And what constrains, what are the constraints that jeopardize the global marketplace? Now I know Marvin is first going to say tariffs. And I agree with that. <laughs> you know, Paul Ryan, he's developed this uh, response. Anytime somebody asks him what the president is doing on tariffs, he just says, tariffs are bad, let's move on. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a pretty good uh, place to be. Uh, but tariffs are uh, a challenge to us in terms of agriculture. But the second part of the challenge that we face is food security issues. And as I travel to uh, Europe, as I travel to Cuba or China or Japan, or I meet with uh, the uh, Korean delegation as they come here, I talk to their secretary or ministers of agriculture, and what they talk about is not just our marketplace, they talk about food security and how can we make sure that we can protect our consumers. And so that is critical for us to assure the global marketplace of our food security and our initiatives in our agricultural marketplace. And so if a customer from overseas intends to buy a million dollar shipment of rice and an Arkansas company can prove through our blockchain that they are selling a safe product that has been traced from the farm to the consumer and we're competing with a company from a different region of the world that isn't blockchain verified who makes the sale? And do we have a better chance of opening up our agricultural commodities to China and to Europe if we can show blockchain verified technologies and products? And yes, I think that increases our opportunity in the global market space. And that's what we have to do for our producers. And so as uh, Frank Giannis, Vice President of Food Safety at Walmart says, it's the equivalent of FedEx tracking for food. I got that out of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Th 
thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, currently, uh, there is an ongoing investigation into E. coli contamination of romaine lettuce. The uh, Centers for Disease Control out of Atlanta says it is sick in 197 people in 35 states with five dead. The investigators are challenged because some of the romaine records aren't electronic. The lack of data uniformity and the use of paper forms can dramatically slow down the tracebacks. And so to help solve that paper problem, blockchain means the farmers and the pickers and others in the supply chain will enter data by a mobile app into a secure and immutable ledger, which becomes the blockchain. Now that is the opportunity for us. There can be other benefits to a food security blockchain. If a supplier received a shipment of produce that took longer than expected to arrive, they might ordinarily throw it out. But with blockchain identifiers, we can use the specific food cycle data to eliminate waste or to make the produce available to a nonprofit food bank before the expiration date. It gives us more precise information for food handling to eliminate and reduce waste and to make sure that we utilize it in a proper way. In other words, we have more precise information. And blockchain will allow agricultural producers to brand their product as raised in Arkansas with the information on how it was raised. So those are just some of the scratches of the surface as to what could be done with blockchain technology in the food security and the supply chain for agriculture. You're here today to imagine the world with more significant blockchain and agriculture. And your answers will be much more innovative than mine. Uh, your conclusions will be more dramatic. And your vision of the future will be more meaningful for shaping our future and to improving the world of agriculture in our state. And whenever it's the number one industry uh, in our state, that means it's important to me. And, uh, and technology is important. So you combine agriculture with technology, we're brought here today, and then you combine that with retail, you combine it with education, you combine it with the further processing, and it benefits everybody. And so we've got, uh, uh, and, I, and I said everybody here knows all this about blockchain, we intentionally actually invited some producers that might not know a whole lot about it. And that's important for you to hear, because the challenge in the marketplace is having that producer on the farm utilizing that mobile app and uh, moving away from a paper system. So you need to hear from them and to hear the challenges uh, that might be faced. And so uh, let me conclude by saying I'm excited that you're here. Uh, what you're going to be doing today is uh, you're going to be hearing from some experts, but more importantly, you're going to be gathering in working groups. Uh, these numbers here, I think, mean something. And it worries me that he's writing things when I'm, uh, but uh, I hope it's good stuff. Uh, but uh, we've got a recorder here as well. And so I'll be leaving. Uh, I'll be coming back, though, uh, this afternoon, and I'm going to hear a report from the working groups. I'm going to spend some time here uh, with you. And I'm excited about uh, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're going to have a discussion, the fact that your brains are going to work together and we're going to come back and see what uh, opportunities present for the state. This is industry-led. Uh, we're just a convening uh, enterprise here as the state. But as there's opportunities for the state to contribute, we want to do that. If there's opportunities for the state to build on what you're doing in the industry, we want to take advantage of that. So consider us as a facilitator, as a partner, and as somebody that's going to be a cheerleader. So thank you for being here, and with that, I'll turn it back. Well, thank you very much, Governor Hutchinson. You've done a wonderful job of really creating this vision and setting the tone for us today. So uh, thank you for your sponsorship. I'm Christy Weiser. I'm a client director at IBM, and I have the honor of announcing our next few speakers. Um, first of all, I'm very pleased to announce a man who's not only an author and an adjunct professor, but he's also a visionist and really a champion for blockchain globally. 
Um, so he spends a lot of time talking about food traceability, transparency, and security. He's here to share that perspective with us today. So please join me in welcoming Frank Giannis, Vice President of Food Safety for Walmart. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you, and it's a real pleasure being here and an honor. Thank you, Governor, for those words, uh, that vision, uh, great inspiration, and we're truly humbled and honored to be here. Uh, this issue of food safety, food security, reducing food waste is critically important. It's not only important for individuals, they need food to survive, it's good for families, it's health at home, it's good for societies, and it's good for the nation. And so we have, we have just applied your vision, uh, Governor. If you can please pull up my first. What I'm going to do is let me begin by doing something a little bit different. Uh, what we're working on is blockchain to enhance and create a smarter, more sustainable, and efficient food system. But I'd like to begin with uh, this video that to kind of to tell the story in about 90 seconds. What I want you to really take away is we're not working on a technology, we're working on a vision for a better future. We'll show the video in a little bit more. That's the vision, a smarter, safer, and more sustainable food system. At Walmart, we stand for saving money for people so that they can live better. And nowhere is that more important than it is in food. I think everyone here knows the size of Walmart and our company, close to $500 billion in total revenue. About half of that is related to food sales. We're operating in 28 countries around the world, serving over 260 million customers a week, tens of thousands of food suppliers, about 13,000 retail establishments, online platforms, 2.2 million associates. And you can imagine providing safe, affordable, and sustainable food is a daunting challenge. But more important than a challenge, we view it as an important responsibility. And so we love the vision of a smarter and safer food system starting right here in Arkansas. You're going to hear some reoccurring themes in alignment, but it's important. Why Arkansas? Uh, many of you, I know, were not born and raised in the state. I happen to now love the state of Arkansas, but I'm a transplant, arrived here 10 years ago. But when I think about blockchain and food, I think Arkansas is a pretty good place to be. As you've heard earlier today, it's one of the most influential regions in the, in the country regarding food. Arkansas has the capacity and is a food basket to the nation and it can be and is a food basket to the world. We know there's large companies here, as you referenced, big retailers, big food manufacturers, logistics companies. And we know that we have the University of Arkansas. We have FDA located here. We have a very proactive government and governor that's sponsoring this and other industries. And so I like to think about, if I wanted to learn a little bit about the entertainment industry, I'd probably put a star on the map and go to California or Burbank or Hollywood. If I wanted to learn a little bit about Wall Street and the financial sector, I'd put a star on the map and I'd go to New York. But if you want to know how food gets produced and flows in this nation, putting a star right here on the state of Arkansas is probably where I'd put it. 
And the way Arkansas goes in food is probably the way most of the nation goes. And so this is a really good place to actually do this. Now, why is a digital and transparent food system important? Let me begin by telling you, and I, and I stress this a lot, we're going to talk a lot about this new and emerging digital protocol called blockchain. But I promise you at Walmart, we are not chasing blockchain. We're not chasing the new fad or the shiny coin. What we are committed to is trying to resolve some business challenges that exist in the food system today. And while by and large the food system today is pretty marvelous, if you think about it, tens of thousands of food products in your typical grocery store, you can go in and get fresh available food from all around the world for a fraction of your hard-earned dollar. There are some challenges with food, and if you look over the horizon, there's some reason to be concerned. Some of the challenges are food safety. While by and large food safety doesn't affect most of us, it still is a problem in most developed countries and certainly in developing countries around the world. And when you hear foodborne statistics like 48 million cases in the United States or 3,000 deaths, Remember that behind all of those statistics and numbers, there's faces of real people. People like your grandparents, or your children, or grandchildren. And so it's been estimated that a 1% reduction in foodborne disease in our nation alone will save the US economy about $700 million. And so we're addressing food safety. How about traceability? The governor mentioned the Romaine incident, and I'll come back and talk a little bit about it. But real cost to real farmers destroying the livelihood of a lot of farmers that weren't implicated. And so more effective tracking and tracing is good for the food system. Food fraud, economically motivated adulteration. And while we like to think all actors in the food system are doing things responsibly, there are some unscrupulous actors that will substitute inferior ingredients or even fake ingredients. The image here is just a reminder of what happened in the United Kingdom and Europe a few years ago where British consumers were going out and buying products such as 100% beef lasagna, and guess what? There was no beef in it at all. It was horse meat substituted because it was cheaper at the time. So imagine a digital footprint that allows you to really track what's happening with food and deterring those types of unscrupulous activities. Regulatory requirements. A lot of regulation, and it's not only in the United States, but in developing countries around the world. More and more requirements for records and actions to demonstrate that you're producing food according to regulation. A digital system that allows you to facilitate and ease that burden on producers is good for food. I want to focus on these last two because the topic of food security came up, and it has to do with freshness of food waste. It's been estimated that one-third of all food that gets produced gets wasted. Now, where that waste occurs on the food continuum differs depending on what country you're in. But nevertheless, one-third is criminal. One-third of all food. Imagine going into your favorite grocery store, buying three bags of grocery, and as you walk out, you throw one bag of grocery away. Does it sound ridiculous? Of course it does, but that's what's happening all around the world every day. And so a digital food system that allows you to track and trace how food is produced, optimizing supply chains. And by the way, we think we operate, operate pretty good supply chains, but the folks that are into supply chain information know that little tweaks and improvements in supply chains make a big, big difference. And not only that, capturing digital information to know what type of production methods increase yield and quality. And then last but not least, transparency. You know, transparency is one of those words that we're hearing a lot. We hear it in political circles, we hear it in governments and academic institutions. And in fact, if you look at all the trends for society, transparency is probably one of the words that gets on the top 10 list. We believe we're going to work together today not to make transparency just a buzz phrase, but to make it a reality. How can you create a more transparent food system so that you really know how food is produced and how it flows from farm to table? And guess what? If we don't do it, it's going to happen. Consumers are demanding it. And not only are consumers demanding it, but you'll see increased regulations to become a little bit more transparent. So we're solving these business challenges. Now, why blockchain? I'm not a blockchain expert. I've been working in food for most of my career, 30 plus years. In the past two years, I've spent a lot of time working on blockchain. And I will tell you, if some of you are sitting out here and you're a bit of a blockchain skeptic, I don't think there's anybody in the audience that was a bigger blockchain skeptic than Frank Yannis. Uh, the IBM team will remind, I, I tend to look a little bit friendly and smile, but in these meetings I had my arms crossed and I was thinking, why am I here? I have a lot of work to do. Why am I? Because we've been chasing this 
holy grail of food transparency and traceability for a long, long time. And it's never scaled. We've been digitizing information for decades, right? Digitizing information isn't anything new. But the way blockchain digitizes information is truly different and new. This is the only technical slide that I'll present, and I'll do it in kind of a food layperson's viewpoint. If you look at the data model on the left, that's a centralized data system. And then you see decentralized and distributed. We often talk about a food chain, implying that it's very simple and linear. All of you that work with food, you know it's not a simple food chain, right? The definition of blockchain, you see it up there, a decentralized and distributed digital ledger, right? We've all heard, and what does that mean? If you think about the food system, it's not a food chain, but the food system is a distributed and decentralized food network. And so it's almost as though blockchain and the food system were made for each other. The other things that you'll hear about today and as you study blockchain are these features that are really important. You hear these concepts of immutability. Once information gets into a blockchain, it gets converted to an alphanumeric sequence, a hash. And then it gets shared with different nodes in a blockchain network. And so it's hard to change that. And if you change it, everybody has to agree to that change. So it scales trust. You hear the principle of consensus. Everyone has to agree with it. It's one version of the truth, not five different versions. Providence, being able to trace back, it's democratic. It truly is. This is one of the most powerful concepts for me on blockchain. And our CEO, Doug McMillan, talks about it in terms of creating shared value. If you look at the system to the left here, this is the way we've tried to digitize food for the past 20 years. Walmart, I was the requester and got Walmart to fund a supply chain transparency system. And it looks like this. It's the model to the left. The big circle at the bottom is Walmart, the retailer. Could be a food service company. Circle above that is the supplier. Circle above that is the ingredient supplier. And we ask people to put data into a centralized database that Walmart owns and controls. The only one that benefits from that is Walmart. In a blockchain network, because it's distributed and decentralized, whoever gets into the network owns their data and determines through permissioning who they share it with. And as that ecosystem gets smarter, participants in that ecosystem get smarter together. And so it democratizes information. And so when we've talked to farmers, they say, we have an interest in participating in this. Because when Romaine gets criticized for being involved in an outbreak and I have to pull product, it might not be my product. I might not be the guilty one. Suppliers are saying they want to participate because when their products don't make shelf life, they get blamed. But in the blockchain network, we switch or move from what we call fault finding to fact finding, and they benefit. So it creates shared value. And so there's some distinct features about blockchain that are new and different. And when you understand it, and more importantly, when you start working on it, you become a blockchain believer. Business case. The governor touched on this. A couple of months ago, there was an outbreak, and the outbreak, I think, were, is tapering off, but nevertheless, a significant outbreak. 197 cases of E. coli 157, 97 hospitalization, very high, almost a 50% hospitalization rate, 26 cases of HUS, that stands for hemolytic uremic syndrome, severe kidney failure, and five deaths. Tragic. Government officials weren't sure of the source other than they believed the romaine lettuce came from Yuma, Arizona. They put out a public health advisory, rightfully so, that said, Americans don't eat romaine lettuce from Yuma. You know the size of Yuma? 200 plus square miles. A lot of farmers in Yuma, Arizona. They said retailers don't sell it, and so retail and food service establishments all across this land pulled romaine lettuce. They've not been able to trace it back to a source because of the ability to track and trace. And this inability to track and trace and have transparency in the food system is an Achilles heel. We became convinced with a couple of the pilots that we did, but I'm going to just give you a little bit of insight into one pilot Walmart did here in the United States with IBM using mangoes. And we picked mangoes because produce is often at the heart of these traceback issues. And to tell you a little bit about our pilot, I have to tell you the story of the life of a mango. A mango uh, gets planted by a seedling, and it takes anywhere from seven to eight years for that mango seedling to mature to a, to a beautiful tree that's producing fruit. Mangoes are grown in this hemisphere in small farms on Central and South America. And when those mangoes are ripe, they send farm crews out to pick those mangoes. Those mangoes then go to a packing house 
from the packing house. They get washed, treated, and boxed. They then get shipped to the United States by air, land, or sea. Once in the United States, and the product that we're interested in, those mangoes get further processing, washed, peeled, and sliced, placed in these clear trays, refrigerated, and shipped to 43 Walmart distribution centers across the country. And then from there, they get picked up by the Walmart fleet of trucks and shipped to Walmart stores across the United States. It's a pretty complicated journey. We put them out for refrigerated display and hope mom and dad pick them up and take them home for their families. Now, if I wanted to know where those mangoes came from, how do you think I'd do that? Do you think it'd be easy? In the United States, there's a legal requirement for what is called one step up, one step back traceability when it comes to food. And it stemmed from the Bioterrorism Preparedness Act, not even food safety or food modernization. It had to do with bioterrorism preparedness. And you think about one step up, one step back for bioterrorism preparedness, that's not sufficient. <laughs> but anyways, if I wanted to know, I'd have to talk to a lot of actors in that food system, get a lot of copies of paper, even if they were digitizing it, we found out that they're digitizing using disparate systems, and so it's almost impossible to have the long view. And so we did just that. Got a package of those mangoes, I brought them into my staff meeting, put it on the table, and I literally asked my team, I said, the trace back exercise starts right now. Tell me where these mangoes originated from. And how long do you think it took our team to trace those mangoes back to source? See, the FDA is still working on Romaine. Spinach outbreak of 2006, it took them two weeks. Took our team six days, 18 hours, and 26 minutes to say, Frank, the mangoes in this package came from these two farms in Brazil. We started working with IBM on this proof of concept, and we started digitizing information in all of those sections of the food continuum for mangoes, as you saw, our suppliers and their suppliers, capturing information on the blockchain. And then we had the courage, uh, in hindsight, I probably wouldn't do this again, to do a live demo in front of 23 media outlets at Walmart shareholder media, <laughs> scanned a package of mangoes, and we were able to trace back with specificity on a, on a map of where these farms came, produced the mangoes. And it was two farms in Mexico. Traceability in 2.2 seconds. We refer to that as food traceability at the speed of thought. As fast as you can think it, you can know it. But even more important than food traceability, it was food transparency. We had a complete view on how those mangoes flowed from farm to the packing house, across the custom broker, to our DCs, and to our stores. It was the equivalent, we used the analogy, of shining a light on the entire food system. And granted, even though we think we're pretty good at flowing food, we saw where the opportunity really lied because it just screamed out at you three days getting it across the customs border. Three days on a perishable product like that about 14 days of shelf life. Imagine if you can take two of those days out, those two days of freshness that you give back to the customer, less food waste at home. If you really want to run smarter food systems, you might say, hey, I don't have to pick the mangoes when they're somewhat not totally ripe, because people do that so that they make shelf life. I can optimize and give you a better tasting mango as, as the customer. And all of the intelligence that you might gather to say, well, how do we optimize for a mango? How do we grow them in a more sustainable fashion to reduce inputs and the amount of water that it takes? And so that was pretty convincing. After that, our CEO, Doug McMillan, started reaching out to a lot of companies. And some of the organizations mentioned here in this room, you know, talking to folks at Tyson. And even, Doug even reached out to other retailers and said that this issue of food security and food safety shouldn't be a competitive issue. Now, why is that so important? Because we talk about wanting to have transparency. Transparency is good for all stakeholders. It's good for government, it's good for consumers, it's good for the private sector, it's good for academia. What's the opposite of transparency? Opacity. That's as good, it's a good definition. My favorite is anonymity. Not really knowing how food was produced and how it flowed from farm to table. And you talk about wanting to increase confidence in goods produced in Arkansas, you provide transparency. We proudly produce food in this fashion. Here are the certificates of analysis. This is where it was produced. This is how it was grown. Transparency is a good thing because it drives accountability, we believe. And then longer term, because we're not really so into accountability, we'd prefer for people to be responsible. We believe that accountability then shifts to responsibility. People self-governing their behaviors because they know it's transparent. And so we believe that blockchain will create a more transparent food system and a more transparent food system will be a better food system. 
And so with that, we thank you, Governor, for your vision, very inspired by your comments this morning. We thank each and every one of you for being here. I do believe that we can make Arkansas the breadbasket of the world. And I want to thank you in advance for all that you're going to do and you are doing to provide safe and affordable food so that people can live better. Thank you very much.